how you doing? You doing good? Yes, I'm so excited to be sharing with you today. That was April. I want to just thank Pastor Joey and April. If this is your first time, they are lead pastors and they are on sabbatical right now. So it is an honor and a privilege to be able to share with you today. Now listen, I'm the only girl on your lineup of speakers this summer. So I think we're going to have a good time today. It's going to be fun. And you're in the right place. And um, if we haven't met yet, my name is Lanisa. Ryan, who is usually up here leading worship, playing the guitar, he's my husband. And we have been here. There he is. Hey. <laughs> Just walks out. We have been at Wellspring and on staff here for two years, so you guys are family to us, and we love you, so I'm excited to just spend some time with family today. I'm going to talk to you like family. Does that sound good? Good. Awesome. Well, if you have your Bibles, I hope you brought them today. Go ahead and open them up to Jeremiah chapter 31. If you have your phone that has a Bible app, open it up. I think it's so important for us to lay our eyes on the actual Bible right in front of us, but if you don't have your Bible, of course, it will be on the screen today. First half of your Bible, Old Testament. We're going to be reading in Jeremiah 31. And I don't know if you know this, but Jesus actually referenced the Old Testament many times. Over 73 times he referenced the Old Testament. He referred to it as the scriptures, the word of God, the wisdom of God. Even while he was on the cross, he referenced the Psalms. So the Old Testament is so important for us to read as followers of Jesus. If you want to know who God is, it is seeped in the Old Testament. It is seeped in there because as God's people live out their story. We see who God is shown. We see how he acts to his kids and how he, he moves on behalf of his kids. So that's what we're going to be. But first, I want to tell you a little story. How many of you have ever experienced a day that just felt like it was never ending? Never ending day. You are just worn out by the end of it. You have energy and excitement at the beginning of it, and at the end, you are done. Anybody? Anybody? I'm going to tell you a story, and you're really going to resonate if you're from Florida. So Ryan and I have been, um, well, we dated for four years before we got married. And I'm a Florida girl, so I love Disney. Anybody else love Disney? Controversial? It's okay. I love Disney. And so we would, I would drag him, he says drag him, to Disney often. We live far away, so we would have to get up really early in the morning, drive four hours to Disney World. Bless his heart. Four hours to Disney World, and we would get there. We'd be so excited. We'd get our tickets, get into the park, head to Tomorrowland, head to Buzz Lightyear. And the little carousel progress, people mover, anybody? That's my kind of Disney right there. People mover all the way. There is a picture of us. Look how happy. Oh, you guys know how this ends, right? Look, so excited, so happy to be there, enjoying the day. Lunchtime comes around, our energy's a little low, no problem. Get some caffeine, get a churro, head to the other side of the park, yeah? And any smart person around 5 or 6 o'clock would probably look at each other and be like, it's been a good run. It was a good day. I still like you. My feet don't hurt that much. We should go home. We should end it on a high note. So what do we do? Because we're smart people, right? We look at each other and we say, you know what? My energy is like, it is almost out. So you know what we should do? There's this parade that happens in like two hours. We should stay around for that. So we go and find our place to sit for the parade. We wait for an hour. We watch this parade that hasn't changed in 20 years. And literally every time, you can ask Ryan every single time we stay for this parade. And I look at him afterward, and he's like, I hate my life. I literally, I cannot feel my feet. This is not enjoyable. You look around, babies are crying. Parents are trying to get their babies not crying with the bubble machines. They didn't get you on the way in with the bubble machine, but they're going to get you on the way out with that bubble machine. Happiest, what is it even called like? Happily ever after is, I think, the parade. Lies. Lies. So that, <laughs> now that's a day. But some of us, all of us, can probably resonate that there are seasons in our life that feel like they are never ending. Our faith started high, and now the, we're in the middle of this season, and we are worn out. Anybody else yeah. been in a situation like that? Yes. That's exactly where we find the Israelites in our text today. So I want to give you just a little bit of context. I want to tell you what's happened because it's important for us to know. We're going to read what God says. So it's important for us to know what has happened before he says what he's about to say. So does that sound good? Can I tell you some context? Yeah. Awesome. All right, y'all got to be with me. You're the 1045 group, okay? You need to be with me. So here's the context. Israel is God's chosen people, and they have been on a journey with God. God has set them free from slavery. He's led them to a promised land. He's given them commandments. Hey, this is what it looks like to be a people of God with me as your God. 
He has been faithful to them. But we see a common theme with Israel that I resonate with, and you probably do too, because human nature doesn't change. And the common theme that we see is Israel is continually turning their backs on God. And we reach Jeremiah 31, and literally Israel has reached their tipping point. They are done. They have utterly turned their back on God. Utterly turned their back. They're living in injustice. They're living in idolatry to the point of child sacrifice. They're coming to church on Sunday worshiping, and the rest of the week they're worshiping other idols. They look exactly like the world around them. They're addicted to selfishness. I mean, they want safety from their enemies. They want peace without actually having to follow the God of peace. Hello. That is where the Israelites are. It's where we find them. And yet in the middle of that situation, God sends Jeremiah, an Israelite priest, and he calls him to be a prophet. He says, Jeremiah, I want you to go to Israel. I want you to tell them. I want you to warn them. I'm going to allow Babylon to conquer them because of their flagrant sin. And that's exactly what happens. Jeremiah warns the people. Babylon conquers Israel for 70 years. That's somebody's lifespan. 70 years, these people are in exile. And in the middle of their exile, and this is our text today, God speaks to them in the middle of their exile, and he speaks hope, and he speaks restoration. And that says a lot about who God is. So that's where we get to our text today. We're going to read a few verses. You ready to read them with me? All right, verse 1 says, At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. He's talking about the restoration that's going to come. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you and you will be built. I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob, and he has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. And here's my favorite part. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of God. They shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord. In the middle of their exile, in the middle of their wilderness, God says that Israel experienced grace there. And so what I want to talk to you about today is the wilderness seasons. The season in your life, the area in your life, and I, I know that there are some of you who are in this because this is, I know God gave me this word for you today. Those wilderness seasons where your faith is dwindling. Your faith was high. You had faith that God was going to move. You heard promises, but you have just been walking and walking and walking months, years, and now your faith is done. It is low. Maybe you've experienced pain. You've experienced something very difficult happen, and now you're just in this waiting season with God. You have prayers that still aren't answered. Maybe you have an illness that's still lingering. You have a child that's still wayward. You know that God is good. You have the knowledge that God is good, but you're in this wilderness season. Anybody else identify with this wilderness season? Listen, and the thing is that, here's the thing. We often view pain as a violation to us as children of God. We view pain as, I am in this wilderness season. I'm experiencing this pain. This is, this is a violation. I should not experience this as a child of God. Something is wrong. Something is not right. But that's not true. Pain is not a violation. The most painful thing that could have ever happened to man happened to the Son of God. Pain is not a violation. It actually is an opportunity for you to experience something that can change you forever. About a year ago, I was up here speaking to you. And Ryan and I had just experienced a very difficult miscarriage. I was 11 weeks pregnant, and I spoke to you from that space. And I can promise you, I did not think that a year from now, I would be speaking to you from the same place. Last year, I was like, I'm going to speak to them. I'm going to be pregnant, or I'm going to have a baby already. And we're going to celebrate God's goodness together, because that's what I thought God's 
goodness meant. I did not think that I would still be in this wilderness, but I can tell you, if you know me, I am not the same person that I was a year ago. I am not the same person. My countenance is different. My awareness of who God is has grown so much, and I have a deep hope I'm not the same. And it's because I experienced the grace of God in my wilderness. I experienced, I was thinking about it last night. I was thinking about the last year. What have I experienced that makes me feel so much peace right now, even though my circumstances haven't changed? And it's the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God is the theme. And so what is grace? This is what Jeremiah says God offers to you. Here's the definition of grace. The undeserved unmerited favor of God toward you. That's what grace feels like. Israel experienced grace in their wilderness. God literally gave Israel what they didn't want and what they didn't deserve. And you know what it was? Himself. He gave them himself. And so what does grace feel like? Grace feels like when your faith is so low, when you are faithless, God is faithful to you. When you haven't done anything to deserve it, God's grace feels like he's given you something extra, like an extra oomph, an extra gift that just enough so you can continue moving forward. When you um, feel weary and overwhelmed, when you desperately want breakthrough, when you're tired, grace feels like peace. It feels like being seen. It feels like being safe. And that is the grace that God offers to you. And so I know that some of you are here today and you're just like me and you're in a wilderness season. There's an area in your life that you can identify as dry, you're worn out. It's a wilderness season. It's okay. And I believe that God wants to shift something in you today. I think he wants to transform you with his grace. Because sometimes, here's the thing, the Israelites wanted their circumstances to change. And God says, listen, I am going to restore you. The circumstance will, I am going to restore you. But first, I want to teach you in your wilderness how to want and desire me first. I want to teach you how to be satisfied in me. Everything changes when we learn how to be a people who long for God more than longing for a circumstance change. And sometimes the problem, friends, sometimes the problem is not our knowledge. The problem is strength of soul and wisdom. And oftentimes, we're not going to understand. I don't know why I experience this. I don't know what the season looks like. I don't know when it's going to be over. God doesn't always make it clear. But what he always makes clear is his character. He always makes clear who he is. And so when I was asking God, what is your intention of this passage? This is our main point for today. If you have notes, I want you to, t- to write these down. But this is the main point, that God wants to show you his faithfulness. If I knew every single one of your names, God wants to show you his faithfulness. And oftentimes he shows you in and through the wilderness. We want it other ways. I'm, right, I'm over here. I'm doing good. I'm loving life. I'm at the pool. God showed me your faithfulness now. And he's like, actually, it's right here. Right here is where my faithfulness is going to transform you in and through the wilderness. So what I want to do is I want to just tell you three ways based on Jeremiah 31 that God shows you his faithfulness in your wilderness and how you can respond to that. Does that sound good? Y'all awake this morning? All right, it's going to be so good. So get your notes out. The first way that God shows you his faithfulness in your wilderness, I love this, is God gives you rest. God gives you rest. And here's the caveat. We have a decision to make. We can either be weary or we can rest in God. I'm not talking about feelings, right? How many know there's a difference between feeling weary and being weary? So we have a choice. I can either be weary. I can live weary. I am worn out. Or I can rest in God. I love the scripture in verse 2. It says, when Israel sought for rest... The Lord appeared to him from far away. They were looking for rest. And how does God respond? He appears to them. His presence is how he responds to that. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. We're in the Old Testament. So he says, I have appeared to you from far away. We are not Old Testament Christians. We're New Testament Christians. And so our promise 
is not that God is far away and he has to appear to us. Our promise as New Testament Christians is we have full access to the presence of God right now. When I am weary, when I desire rest, I have full access to the presence of God. I can tell you, there were many times, listen, we had our miscarriage and then we had a lot of sickness. There were many times I was in the St. Joe South Hospital. I do not, I do not like that place. I don't like being there. I, every time I'm like, peace out. I've never come back here to like this place. But there were many times I was there and my feelings were real. I, I had physical pain. I was scared. I had these emotions. And yet, at the base, the base feeling that I had, the base emotion, the base foundation, I had such a peace. I had such a soul rest to the point where literally the the nurses who were sticking me with needles and the nurses dragging me to my hospital room, I felt so compelled to tell them, do you know who Jesus is? Do you know who Jesus is? Because the peace that I feel right now is unreal. It's unreal. My circumstance sucks. It's okay that it sucks. It's life, a broken world. And as a Christian, I have access to the presence of God that makes me go, The world is a whirlwind, and yet I live from a position of God's peace. That is what the rest is that God offers you. You have full access to it. And listen to me. When the presence of God is in a room, in this room, he's here right now, in a hospital room, in your living room, it is very evident that God is there. The presence of God feels very different than any other presence that fills that room. But we often have to, have to learn how to quiet the noise. The world is very noisy. If you've been on social media the past two days, you know that very well. It is very noisy. And we have access to all the noise, or I have access to Jesus. I have access to the rest of Jesus. And I have to make that decision. So how do we respond? How do we respond and accept and get to live in this rest? It's something that he wants you to live in. It's not just this empty promise. The first thing that we have to do is we have to actually allow ourselves to walk through the wilderness. Rest is not found on the other side. We can't go over the wilderness. We can't go around it. We can't go under it. We have to go through it, but that is good news because God walks with you through your wilderness. I tell this to um, some girls I mentor that God... um, reveals himself to you most clearly exactly where you are, not where you wish you were, not in a fake reality, not in your prayers for something to change. He reveals himself to you exactly where you are. His rest is found in the wilderness. So here's some practical things that you can do. These are things I do every day. Write them down in order to experience the rest of God. The first is just invite God into your wilderness. God, I am here. This is my reality. My emotions are valid for it. But God, right now, I invite you into this space. I invite you into the season that I'm in. God, walk with me, be with me. And then you have to turn your attention to God. You have a part part to play. You have to turn your attention and practice recognizing his presence. This looks like every Tuesday at one o'clock, when you go back to that hospital, you have an intention to say, I'm gonna turn off the noise the lies, the things that make me feel anxious because I know that's not Jesus. And I have to intentionally turn myself and say, God, I know that you are here with me. I'm going to fix my eyes on you. I want to recognize you here with me. And guys, it's not complicated. That's literally all you have to do. And God meets you there. He does the rest of it. You don't have to make it happen. You just have to come to him and invite him in. So that's the first way God shows you his faithfulness. God gives you rest. And the second way that he shows you his faithfulness is he reminds you of his heart. He reminds you of his heart. What is his heart? His, God is constantly in your season, constantly, in every avenue. He is reminding you of who he is. He's reminding you of who he is to his kids, how he cares for you, why you can rest in knowing that he goes before you. He's constantly reminding you of his heart. And here's our caveat. This might be my favorite one. We can either live in the what ifs, what ifs, or we can trust God's heart. We can live in the what ifs, or we can trust God's heart. Here's what God's heart is for you, even just shown in Jeremiah 31. It says, God loves you. He is your shepherd. It even says, 
that I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel. God is your father. He is faithful to you. He is good to his children. I want to read verse 13. It says, I will turn their mourning into joy. He's telling you who he is. This is what I do for my kids. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. This is your promise. I will feast the soul of the priest with abundance, my favorite part, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness. Earlier in this chapter, it says, they shall be radiant over the goodness of God. The Israelites' countenance, listen, changed. It says they were radiant over, not a circumstance change, not over being happy, they were radiant over one thing, who God was. They became radiant over the goodness of God. The goodness of God, who God is, is shown everywhere. He is revealing himself to you. If you will choose to not look at your wilderness as a punishment, but as an opportunity to see and to know who God actually is. There's a spiritual disease I don't know if you guys have heard of this. It's a spiritual disease of what if or if only. I know it well. What if my husband dies? What if he leaves? What if God allows this to happen? What if, what if, what if? It's anxiety. I'm pulling it down every time. Or if only, if only they wouldn't have said that. If only I wouldn't have gone through that. If only God wouldn't have allowed this to happen. And when you live... Listen, as the what ifs and the if onlys as your filter, as the things that you are clinging to, that makes even the sturdiest of hearts anxious. And what it does is it makes you spiritually stagnant. What if, what could happen if only? And so again, God is revealing himself to you. God does not change in your wilderness. That's good news. <laughs> God is steadfast. He is faithful. He's the same God. God does not change in your wilderness, but you will change in your wilderness if you allow yourself to notice God. You have to look for him. If you look for God, if you expect God tomorrow morning, if you expect him throughout your day and the things that your friends say to you and what you read in scripture and what somebody speaks on a Sunday morning and the songs that God is speaking to you. He wants you to know, hey, I'm right here. I'm right here. Notice me. I'm right here. This is who I am. You can trust me. So here's what we do. Here's how we can respond. It's really simple. You ready? You just have to change your what if. What if God allows this is a hard place to live? That's not fun. Or you can change your what if really simply. What if God is actually good to me? What if God is actually faithful? What if God is actually good? And how does that change how I can face this season? Some of us need to say that right now, tomorrow morning. I'm waking up. Okay, what if God is actually good to me? How does that change the way that I go and talk to this person? How does that change the way that I walk out my day? How does that change the way that I face my hardship? Change your what if. That's the second thing. So God gives you his rest. He reminds you of his heart. And then the third thing, this is huge, is that God promises you restoration. God promises restoration. In this chapter, God not only promised the Israelites that he was going to bring them to their promised land, but later in the chapter, he actually promises them an everlasting covenant. He says, I am going to bring you to your promised land, yes, but eventually I'm going to bring someone who's going to take the iniquity of your sin. He's talking about Jesus. He is literally prophesying in Jeremiah 31 about Jesus who is coming. This is the restoration. And so we have access to that. That is a promise that we get a hold of. Restoration in Jesus. But also, Jesus and the Lord, they are going to restore your situation. Whatever you are going through, it's who they are. It's who he is. Three in one God. It's who he is. He is going to restore you. Your season is not in vain. I know it's hard. I know. God is going to restore you. I have a friend who 
lives in Houston, Texas, and she is a beautiful gardener. She has just this gorgeous garden, this patio out back with these chairs that she can just enjoy all the trees and the flowers in the springtime and the summertime. And in February of 2021, Houston experienced the longest, harshest winter they had experienced in 120 years. It was intense, and it absolutely devastated these huge bushes that she had of knockout roses. I think we have a picture of them. This is what the roses looked like. They were just completely devastated. And she was, she was devastated. She was so, after so many years of tending to these, of experiencing these beautiful blooms, and she thought to herself, there's no way that these flowers can come back. There's absolutely, they are so far gone. But what did she do for the next year? She continued to be faithful. She pruned, she fertilized, she watered, she continued to do what she knew to do. And she started seeing a little green leaf here, a little tiny bloom here, but honestly, she was like, I mean, I'm never gonna have what I had before. Like, it is, it's not gonna come back the way that I want it to come back. She ended up going away for about a month on a trip. She came back from her trip, and to her utter surprise, here is what her roses looked like. Isn't that amazing? This is real life. This is what her roses looked like. The shock, listen, the shock that these roses experienced in that harsh winter is what enabled them to produce 10 times the amount of roses, 10 times the amount of fruit, 10 times the amount of life. They needed that wilderness. I think we even have a close-up shot. I mean, look at that. That is beautiful. Tell me God doesn't speak to you through something like that. They needed that wilderness. And the truth is that she didn't get what she had before, but she got so much more. She, had, she got to experience so much more life, so much more fruit from those things, and you will too. God is a restorer. Some of you don't believe me because your situation looks impossible. God's really good at the impossible. I would bet to say that you have a better chance of experiencing the depth and the fullness of God's love for you if you're in an impossible situation. It's time to get your hopes up. It's time to realize that you have full access to Jesus. You have full access not only to his presence, but to the name of Jesus, the powerful name of Jesus. Some of you are weary today because you have not allowed yourself to access and to take hold of the name of Jesus in your life. The name of Jesus Christ casts out any other name. Anxiety, worry, death, those things are not your story. The difficult thing that you are going through, they are a part, miscarriage is a part of my story, but it is not my story. If I meet you, I'm not going to say, hi, I'm Lenise, I had a miscarriage, how are you? It's okay to laugh, I've healed, I've gone through it. <laughs> That's not my story. You don't want to know my, who my story is, what my story is, what your story is, it's God. God is your story. Who God is, becoming your identity, becoming your filter will change everything for you. You will be free. You will be light. And it's not that you won't experience difficult things, but all of those emotions come back to the truth of who God is. And the truth of who God is sets captives free. It heals. It restores. And so what I want to leave you with today is just this challenge. God is faithful to his kids. Whether you believe it or not, God is good. You don't have to believe it for it to be true. He is going to be good to you. It's who he is. He is faithful to you, and he's faithful to his name. He has inscribed his name on you with the blood of Jesus. And he's not only going to be faithful to you as his kid, but he's going to be faithful to his name. Does that make sense? Who he, he's not going to allow his name to go to shame. He is faithful, but he has asked you, and he has asked me to be faithful in return. He is inviting you and me to walk through the wilderness and to realize that darkness is not darkness to him, that he walks with you. And he's inviting you to receive his rest, to remember his heart, 
and to remember the promise of restoration that is coming. I would love to pray for you. If you guys want to join me, just close your eyes, bow your head. I know that there are some people in here today who are weary. You are in a situation, a season of life where you are worn out and you hear this message today and you want to experience this soul rest that we're talking about. You want to experience Jesus, God's presence. You want to feel light. You want to be radiant over the goodness of God. You want to go through this season a different way. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Or you're in a season of wilderness. Yes, you're not the only one raising your hand. I would love to pray for you. God, right now, we come to you with our reality. We're not afraid to say it's our reality. And God, we ask that you would meet us right here. God, I pray that you would lift the heavy weight that we are carrying. You told us we don't have to carry it, that you carry all the heaviness. You're strong enough for it. And God, I pray that you would help these individuals to be aware of you, to realize you are offering them full soul rest. You are offering them freedom. You are offering them peace. So God, we accept that today as weary souls. God, you say that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And so today we choose to turn and to accept your easy yoke. And maybe you're in this room today. You're a different group because you're weary, but you're just weary over life. Life has worn you out. And you've realized that you have never given your life to Jesus. Especially the past two years, it has just worn you out. And you realize, I want to I want to do life a different way. I want to experience the Jesus that she's talking about that makes my countenance different, that makes my life different, that gives me the ability to walk from a position of peace. If that's you today and you've never given your life to Jesus, today is your day. Everything is about to change for you in the best way way. If that's you, I would love for you to raise your hand on the count of three. I'm not going to call you out. I just want to know who I'm praying for. And you're not going to be the only one raising your hand today. But if that's you, if you want to give your life to Jesus, raise your hand on one, two, three. Praise God. Lord, we love you. If, that, if you raise your hand today, or maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you know that that's you, your heart is pounding right now. I want you to just repeat the simple prayer after me. It's super simple. God doesn't make salvation complicated. Repeat this after me and to yourself. God, I admit that I have lived life without you and that I have sinned. God, I repent of my sin and I want to turn and go a different way. I believe that you have sent your son Jesus to take the punishment for my sin on the cross and that his, with his resurrection, you've given me a new life. I confess you are Lord. I want to give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we put our hands together for anyone who accepted Jesus? That's the best decision you could make, I promise you. If that was you, if you said that prayer, I would love to meet you. We have volunteers in the green shirts who would love to meet you, give you a Bible, give you some resources. I'd love to just shake your hand, speak some life over you. But we're gonna end our service. This is the most important part of our service. And this is where we respond to God, all of us. So if you guys would just stand with me. The worship team is gonna lead us through a song of worship. The most important way you can live your life, if you don't get anything else today, the most important way you can live your life as a follower of Jesus is to live your life in response to Jesus, responding to him. That's why this is so important because you just receiving knowledge, we talked about that, that's not the problem. The problem is your strength of soul and that happens when you meet with God, when you respond to him. So that's what we're gonna do today. We have stations up here. Maybe you wanna come and take communion. You realize God, this is my season, and I want to go a different way, and I'm going to start that by just taking communion with you. Or you want to light a candle. We have crosses up here where you could surrender something to the Lord, but take some time, worship, respond to him. Thank you guys so much for letting me share with you. I love you. I'm rooting you on. I believe God has a beautiful plan for you, and even if you don't believe it yet, who he is remains. So let's worship.